apologize for the emotions. Um, I just got back from Israel. Um, I bring that up not because this is about me, but because um, I went there not as a pilgrimage, but as a, um, an opportunity to meet with some with some high-ranking politicians and superior or Supreme Court judges and um, university professors, and it was right up my dad's alley. And several several times I thought, oh, I'm going to share that with dad. Um, one of the trips we made was to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum. Um, the direct translation is a monument and a name. Um, while not to distract from everything that is the Holocaust, um, that's what we're doing here is uh, celebrating my dad um, and what he did in his life. Um, okay. I've been thinking all week, I've been thinking all week what to say exactly that would capture my dad, um, and, um, do need to speak about his father a little bit when we would stay with them, and frequently we would stay with both sets of grandparents growing up, um, and, um, I would stay with my grandfather and my sister would stay with my grandmother and my grandpa would regale me with um, fighting in the streets of Manhattan as a young kid, <laughs> carrying blackjacks in his pocket so he could get the upper hand on somebody or always in fist fights and boxing matches and um, would literally get dressed up on a Friday or Saturday night just to go out fighting. <laughs> Um, and that wasn't my dad at all, <laughs> but he loved the tough guy, the John Waynes, the, um, the Clint Eastwoods, the Ronald Reagans, you know, the, 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 the Rambo photo of Ronald Reagan dressed as Rambo, that kind of stuff. Um, and these last few weeks I've been thinking about that, you know, my dad's not at all like my grandpa wanting to go out fighting all the time or but what what is it what did and what was his attraction to these tough guys uh, we always um, shared various quotes from John Wayne um, and um, one one of the stories he always told me was a drill sergeant he had in the National Guard and they were they were out in the field and it was super windy and clouds of dust all over these tanks are moving and you're just filthy and this drill sergeant that he had under his command um, smoked cigars and he was trying to light a cigar and it wouldn't light and he tried and tried and tried and this went on for five minutes my dad's just watching him never he never smoked and finally this drill sergeant just took the cigar and crumpled it up and threw it in his mouth and just started chewing it. <laughs> and my dad thought that that was the greatest story ever because it, it showed complete mental toughness. And ultimately, that was my conclusion, that my dad, um, if not physically tough, was extremely mentally tough. Um, I, was, I remember... I was married already, but I, I don't know when it was, maybe 2006, seven, somewhere in there. I was telling him a story and I was kind of complaining about things and, and he said to me, who cares? <laughs> and that may sound cold and cruel or whatever, but he had a point and it jostled me. And I was like, I just thought, yeah, who does care? This, this is meaningless. This is all meaningless and irrelevant. To, the, to what I'm trying to accomplish in my life, and who cares? And um, that, that has stuck with me. And he didn't mean it in a cruel way at, at all. And certainly he was a man of few words. Um, and 
didn't need to say much. There's a few quotes in there um, in the program about him, and um, you obviously you see the quotes and you see the words, but you don't necessarily know the context of some of these things. Um, but um, I can assure you that all of them made us <laughs> made us laugh, um, especially when he said. Um, one of my kids asked him, Papa, what, what are you looking for? And he, and he just said, truth. We had no <laughs> idea what he was actually looking for, but <laughs> that was his, his response. So um, back to some other stories. Um, I wanted to also talk a little bit about service that my dad gave. Um, he was very active in, in politics, both on the lo local level, the state level, the national level. He helped run um, Governor Tom Kane's um, um, campaign at one point early on and um, met with um, um, Ford and Reagan on various occasions. And um, there was an article recently in one of the New Jersey um, political papers, and forgive me if I, I don't recall what it, what it is, the New Jersey Globe. And um, the copies on the table I brought. Oh, excellent. <laughs> and anyway, long story short, I wrote the editor the, that wrote the column, and um, I didn't plan on reading this, but um, I do want to. I do want to read it. He, um, if I kept it. Okay, moving right along. Um, he. He basically responded that I knew your father, and he was a good man, and will be missed. Um, and then you made a, co a great contribution to the um, local political scene. But my dad loved it. He loved the the um, the, discuss the discussion of politics, the um, different views of politics, the arguments that were possible, the the drumming up plans for for various things and um, and he was extremely mentally tough um, when I thought about this a little bit more and that's basically what I learned from my dad in, in the last few weeks of his life um, and really the other thing I want to point out is that um, that he was a um, he was a hard worker that really didn't care about the details. He knew that he wanted to get from point A to point Z, and that the details would work themselves out, and that it, the important part was to get to that Z. And not everybody agreed with him, often critiqued him, for being visionary or whatever you'd like to call it, but that he um, that he needed to spend more time in the details and, and thinking things through. And I came across, and this is one of my more favorite quotes, I, I this was brought back to my mind. I, I think it really deals um, exactly how my, my dad's outlook was. Other people see things and say, why? But I dream of things that never were and I say, why not? Um, that quote is from the late, great um, Irish playwright, George Bernard Shaw. And, um, and my dad understood that um, one's life um, can't really be, um, as one of our um, apostles has said, um, one's life, therefore, cannot be faith-filled and stress-free simultaneously. Another prophet counseled us all about the mercy that is inherent in some adversity. The chastisements we have had from time to time have been for our good and are essential to learn wisdom and carry us through a school of experience we never could have passed through without. And... I think that really is at the essence of why he didn't care about the details. Sometimes did not care about the details. That he was, he understood that um, whatever happens is for our good and our experience. And um, 
to quote one of our scriptures, if we are diligent and are believing, all things shall to get work together for our good. If you walk uprightly and remember the covenant, you have covenanted um, one with another. So, um, it, um, just to continue this um, George Bernard Shaw quote, the problems of the world cannot possibly be solved by skeptics or cynics whose horizons are limited to the obvious realities of life. We need men and women who can dream of things that never were and ask why not. We do not worry about how and when and why. We must be able to say why not. And once again, I really just feel like that epitomizes my dad. And yes, it was oftentimes frustrating to wrap your head around what that meant and be along for the ride. And yet at the same time, um, I saw the fruition of, of that belief system come to pass over and over. Um, with the YMCA, everybody on the board of directors thought that in developing a South Brunswick Plainsboro YMCA, that there was just no possibility to this. And although the, the YMCA eventually did close, it did run for many, for several years. I'm guessing for around five years that ten. it ran, 10 no, years, 10 years. years that it ran successfully. And after it got up and running and yeah. opened, everybody on the board who were those cynics, whose eyes were limited, said to my dad, you know, I never believed it could happen and you never doubted that it could. Um, so oftentimes, once again, um, you can't be faith-filled in your life and stress-free. Um, just because you believe something doesn't mean that others are not going or are, are going to get on board with your thoughts. Um, so that's service to the community and to politics. I didn't want to get too much into politics. Um, uh, that's all I dealt with this last week. Uh, I've had enough of that. Um, but the, um, the one thing I did want to talk about is service to family. And um, as, we, I, uh, as we wrote, came up together um, with, uh, with the obituary, um, my dad always told me that his, um, his favorite sports moment was seeing Jackie Robinson uh, steal home plate at Ebbets Field. He just never thought he could ever see a, an athlete do what this man did. And um, the passion that he shared with that is the same passion that he um, shared with, his, uh, with me and my sister Kristen. I remember two occasions that have to do with sports. One, I told the story at his 60th uh, birthday party, but it doesn't hurt to tell it again. Um, one morning, he, um, he said, let's go to the park before your game and let's practice bunting. And we bunted over and over and over. I want to say it was at least an hour, but it felt like probably more, and I got it down. And, and I don't know if later on at, during the game, when the base is loaded, he spoke to the coach and I was up. He spoke to the coach and said, hey, we just practiced bunting if you want to bunt. Or I really don't know that, um, what the whole story was. But there I was, bases loaded, two outs, and the coach called on me to bunt. And um, my father had the forethought to, um, you know, he didn't know I'd ever be in that position that day, but he had the forethought to prepare me for those um, that situation and others in life. And then I also thought of something that happened to my sister when she played softball. Um, I don't even remember what age she was, but she, very young. And she hit the ball and you know, the stereotypical young softball team, it goes through one kid's legs and then it, the person catches the ball, but it veers off the ball or it veers off the mitt and goes out into the outfield and then the other person picks it up and drops it because he doesn't know how to throw it properly. Well, Kristen got all around the bases, made a home run, crowd went wild, but my dad was standing there cheering um, her on 
and uh, you know didn't diminish from it that hey this was this was a fluke or whatever you know you could have been could have been skeptical of, of the whole situation cynical of the whole situation but he was not um, and then last and um, certainly uh, to my mom he served and I think taught um, taught us well and what to look for a spouse because he was always helping around the house and not just the traditional um, male roles but washing and cleaning up from dinner not necessarily making the dinner but <laughs> helping <laughs> out <laughs> and, uh, doing the barbecuing <laughs> car yeah carving the the meats and just always there to help and um, so his service was to others and just in conclusion, um, the last few weeks he um, lamented the fact that he didn't feel um, useful to anyone. And that's one of the quotes here. Um, he said, um, um, it's somewhere it, it he wanted to get down on the floor with the children meaning the little kids um, and he, he oh here it is it's in the middle I wish I could get on the floor and play with those kids um, referring to his great-grandchildren and um, he just kept saying I wish I could help your mom I wish I was doing something I need to get up and do something in our faith tradition um, we have a, a quote from our scriptures that says, and I beheld that the faithful elders of this dispensation when they depart from mortal life, continued their labors in the preaching of the gospel and re of repentance and redemption through the sacrifice of the only begotten son of God. Um, that's really what he believed and that's really what he was striving for. He kept saying, I'm ready to go, I need to go. And get and get busy um, he's not resting in peace <laughs> um, we don't believe he's resting in peace but um, one of the other religious leaders that I was with um, who I told about my dad's passing said um, uh, he said uh, blessed be his name referring to my dad and I thought um, to me, that's such a better, much better response than resting in peace because um, he wanted to work, he does want to work, he never wanted to rest, and um, I could go on, but I won't because it's hard, and um, but I, I'm so grateful. I, ha I have to tell you a story. Um, we all mourn in different ways. Um, and um, once again, when I was at the, uh, um, the Holocaust Museum, um, I was just thinking about all these people who had passed and before we actually got into the museum, museum. And then when I got into the museum, one of the names of the donors was someone my dad, in these companies my dad represented. And then, um, you know, I dealt with all that is the Holocaust Museum. And then at the end, I also, there was another, yet another name of another client, one, kind of once removed, but another client of my dad um, that donated as well. So it was, to me, it was a tender mercy that, um, that in spite of not being able to share all these political stories and and um, things I had learned about Israel, because my dad, my dad really loved Israel and their approach to things and protecting themselves um, from the various threats. But um, but it was a way for me to kind of have a tender mercy that you know he he was still along for the ride and um, could appreciate um, 
what I grew the log um, over this last week. And I'm so grateful for this time, and I'm very grateful for each of your attendance. And uh, this is exactly what my dad wanted, just something simple. He was never somebody, he was always behind the scenes, never wanted to be the focus of attention or, um, or uh, receive the praise that um, he wanted that for others. But I say this in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> I just um, didn't bring myself to organize my thoughts. So sorry, Dad. He deserves better than my rambling. No, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> he um, loved your rambling. I can't tell if my tears are making me not see or I really need my glasses. I need the font bigger, hoping I can live without them. Um, when I first came home from the hospital when I was a baby, my like ma many babies, my internal clock was completely flipped and I was awake all night and slept during the day. My dad stayed up with me at night, walking the hall with me so my mom could recover from her C-section. This was way back in the day when most dads didn't really do that kind of thing. When I was a little girl, my dad used to wake up really early and before the rest of the house, even though my mom was also an early riser. Um, my dad got up even earlier most of the time. He would be busily trying to accomplish his ever-present to-do list, often sitting at our big kitchen table with files spread out and writing on legal pads, trying to prepare for his day. And I would be the only other one up. And I was always hungry. And he always had time for me to make me bread and butter to tide me over until everyone else in the house was up. My dad built me this really cool, huge dollhouse that I loved. I remember him patiently running behind me, holding onto the back of my bike, encouraging me to pedal faster and ride on my own. Anyone who knows me knows I'm terrible at math and I struggled with it throughout school. Dad would sit with me at our big kitchen table and patiently work with me and never get frustrated, even when I would cry with frustration because I just couldn't get it. I thought he was a genius because he could add a long column of figures in his head as fast as I could enter them on my calculator. That amazed me. And he never showed the exasperation he had to have felt trying to get me to understand algebra. He tried to teach me to play softball, but um, Mike said I played, that's very generous. <laughs> um, I was terrible, but that didn't discourage him. He kept playing catch with me and trying to get me to make contact when I would haphazardly swing my bat at the ball. He came to my games and cheered for me, even though my only success was that infield home run where the other team just kept dropping the ball. When I was growing up, my dad was frequently out at planning board meetings representing clients before local boards, but he always came home from the office for dinner by six to have dinner with the family before he went back out. This wasn't convenient, but he always did it. When he got home early enough, or if he was already home, he would come into my bedroom after I was already in bed for the night, but before I fell asleep, and he would lay by me and ask me how my day was. He would always lay on top of the covers and I would say really insulting things when he got up like, look how big the spot you left was, Dad. <laughs> I can't imagine that I ever told him anything terribly interesting that happened at Monmouth Junction Elementary School. But he listened attentive anyway, and I loved that time with my dad. My dad was a worker, and he taught me to be the same way. No one, except maybe my mom, could ever outwork my dad. He could work harder and longer than people half his age. And being idle was not okay with my dad. Growing up, my brother and I always had chores, and he was an equal opportunity assigner of those chores. There were no girl chores or boy chores, just things that needed to be done. So I helped put in the insulation and worked in the garden and learned how to grout and caulk with dad. Most of all, my dad loved me unconditionally. Yeah. 
I never once doubted his love for me and that I, along with my brother and my mom, were his top priority. My dad treated everyone with fairness and respect. The worst thing I ever heard him say about someone was that they were a glue sniffer. <laughs> <laughs> I never saw him act dishonestly or with anything but integrity. Unlike others of his generation, my dad was never prejudiced. He treated everyone the same. In fact, at the end of his life, when he was on hospice and he had a home health aide who came in every weekday morning to help him with bathing and other tasks. Sorry. Uh, he was Jama a Jamaican man named Lloyd and they became fast friends. One evening when I was visiting my dad in the last couple weeks of his life, he was going in and out of making sense. Sometimes he would th say things that were so off the wall that I couldn't help but laugh. He would tell me to turn off a radio that wasn't on, or one time he told me that he got the meat out and it was on the counter. Well, he hadn't been out of bed all day. And this could be upsetting for my mom, but I tried to just go <coughs> along and tell him, oh no, don't worry about it, dad. I, I put that meat in the fridge. Um, when he, on one of these evenings, I asked him how his day had gone, but he couldn't remember. My mom filled in the gaps and said, oh, remember Andre? Um, Lloyd got you up and sat you in your chair um, remember you had breakfast and Lloyd sat right next to you and you ate together? To which my dad responded in all seriousness, oh, that's right, I was just doing my part to fight segregation. <laughs> uh, I didn't have the heart to tell him that, you know, that was many decades over. <laughs> but, My dad was not only a devoted father, but he was a devoted grandfather, and he was an involved grandfather. I remember this one time, both boys were really sick at the same time, and I can't remember exactly what was going on, um, where Joe was, or where my mom was, or where anybody else was, but the only person I could get a hold of was my dad, and um, Tyler was having you know, the asthma where they need to go on the nebulizer, and I needed to take Austin to the doctor. And he left his office without even thinking about the people who he was going to disappoint there. And he came and he sat with Tyler and patiently held him, did his nebulizer while I took Austin to the doctor. But that was the kind of grandpa he was. As I looked back, on, um, I guess it was the day after, maybe two days after he passed, Allie gave me this stack of pictures that was all um, him and Tyler together. And I couldn't, I couldn't bear to look at them right then. But I've since taken the time to look at them. And I noticed in every one, my dad was looking at Tyler with such love and adoration and just smiling and one of them Tyler was literally and I mean literally not figuratively literally sitting on his head and he was just looking up at him smiling and Tyler did this funny thing where he would climb up him like a jungle gym and then just sit on him in the most contorted ways <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tyler. <laughs> Chris, you have to repeat what he said. Don't cry, Mom. You're not a failure. Right. <laughs> and I thought about those first few years with Tyler where many, many times I couldn't... I just couldn't do it with him. And my dad sometimes would stop after work on his way home and just play with Tyler for a little bit. And that was huge. Sorry, I crossed the line into the ugly cry. I was trying so hard. Um, 
Anyway, it was just so meaningful <coughs> to look at those pictures and to see the bond that he had with Tyler and what a huge part of his life he was and with all of my children. It just took a lot more patience with Tyler. That's why I mentioned that one. Um, as I said, he played with the kids and helped me whenever he could. When his life was drawing to a close, he told my mom that his one regret was never being physically well enough to get down on the floor and give Teddy and Anya horsey rides like he did with all of the other grandkids. But he did get to hold them, all three of his grand great grandbabies, even Penny, which was a wonderful blessing. But lest I give the impression that I think my dad was perfect, let me assure you that I know he had many faults, some of which he even acknowledged. <laughs> For example, he was the only one I ever knew who was a worse singer than I am. <laughs> I cannot carry a tune, but even I could tell it was bad. <laughs> he was completely tone deaf. He wouldn't even stay on the same beat as the hymn, much like Tyler, who just talks the hymns. Uh, so maybe Tyler has Papa to blame for that. Um, he was a distracted and often dangerous driver. I remember being terrified as a passenger with him on numerous occasions, both as a chi child and later as an adult. There were many times I thought, this is how I'm going to die. <laughs> He just always had so much on his mind that he was thinking through. Uh, he was perpetually late for everything because he always scheduled more to do than he could ever actually get done. He always said that he was an optimist, but I would always hassle him and scold him for being unrealistic. He was terrible at choosing and matching his clothes. I mean, awful. If it weren't for my mom, I'm convinced that he would have looked something like a homeless person. In general, his appearance was not a big priority. He was always spilling food and getting stains on his shirts and ties and never even noticed it. My mom would have to just throw his ties out. He was awful at pronouncing um, words and names. Um, my mom remind me, reminded me of one that he would always mix up the words gorge and gouge, which obviously big differences in meanings there. Um, even if the words or the names were really easy, he could mangle any name if given half a chance and would often call people by a different name entirely. Um, and at, at one point or another, um, he always called uh, the grandkids Charlie Brown. He would say, hey, Charlie Brown, hey, Charlie Brown. And we all kind of wondered if it was, he just couldn't remember all their names. <laughs> Like I said, words were tough for him too. Cayenne pepper was frequently called canine pepper. And balsamic vinegar was balsamatic. Where he got that, I don't know. Um, he really was the king of the malapropism. I will miss all of those things, even the things that used to get on my nerves. Most of all, I will miss his smile and his love. <clears throat> The last smile I got from my dad was the week before he passed, and, and the last time I saw him, still alive. He was having a bad time, and he kept, I was the only other one in the room, but he kept, he kept looking up at me and saying, I'm confused, I'm confused. And I was holding his hand and I was reassuring him, you're home, dad, you're in your own room, you're here with mom, you're okay, you're not in the hospital, you're not in the rehab center. And he would kind of calm down a little bit. And then he would look up in a few minutes after we would chat about something else and say again, I'm confused. And I was starting to worry that he was really slipping out and, and so I asked him, I said, Dad, do you know who I am? And he looked at me and smiled. And he lifted his hands to touch my face and he said, I can never forget who you are.
when Tyler was little, he was quite unmanageable, like I said. And sometimes I would put him in the car and take him for a ride in hopes that he would calm down. I would listen to this Amy Grant CD that I had while I was driving around because it seemed to calm us both down. And there's a song on that C CD that I hadn't thought of in years until my dad's passing. And it kept popping into my head over and over. And I've been listening to it on repeat in my head. And so I thought I'd share it with you. Just beginning of one verse. Your smile lit up a room like a candle in the dark. It warmed me through and through. And I guess that I had dreamed we would never be apart. But that dream did not come true. Now missing you is just a part of living. And missing you feels like a way of life. I'm living out the life that I've been given. But dad, I still wish you were here. No singing, just a little musical interlude. You're singing your head. <laughs> yeah, she was singing your head. <laughs> about him is that we would often um, no matter what time of the year it was 
it seemed like we could always talk about the Mets and the Yankees. And so we would chat a little bit about baseball and you know, I would uh, make a few jokes about how much better the Yankees were than the, the Mets or some of the problems and, uh, and the issues the Mets were having. And so, um, you know, that's just one memory that, that I love. And, um, and, you know, going along with jokes, I, I loved um, when um, I would go to visit and my grandfather would be in his recliner, then I would be in the couch uh, sitting right next to him. And um, it, it was almost like he was trying to purposely say something that he knew would get a reaction out of grandma. <laughs> like he would, he would uh, say, oh man, the service is real bad around here. <laughs> and, and then he would kind of almost turn a, a little bit towards my direction as much as he could to, to see if I was chuckling or smiling. And so that's just something I, I really enjoyed about my grandpa and um, really um, knew that he could smile and laugh in, in his hardest time. So like Austin, I like to visit Papa a lot, but I don't feel like I ever really caught him up enough on stuff. So I decided that in one of his little notebooks, I'd write him letters. Um, I won't share a lot because I've written quite a bit since then. I've just shared two short ones. So I said, um, I wish I was a guy, because then I could have a handkerchief. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to do with makeup either. <clears throat> but, um, <laughs> the women's handkerchief. Better than a handkerchief. Yeah. Um, so dear Papa, I hope you don't mind that I'm using your old notebook. I didn't know you collected them too. I felt that I never kept you updated enough. So I figured I'd try and make up for it now. I decided to write down memories I have with you and a list of everyone who gave me their condolences on your behalf. You'll probably find it hard to believe that there's so many. You were always so humble for someone so accomplished and influential. Sorry for not writing sooner. I won't give you an excuse because I know you have a great BS detector. You call me out right away. I also hope you don't mind that I have some of your old sweaters. I still smell like you. Each of the grandkids got one of your elephants. Megan picked out your crystal elephant for me. It's on my dresser now. My mom told me that it's uplifted trunk means good luck. I agree with that, but I see it more as pointing, pointing skyward towards heaven and towards you. I think I'm gonna try and learn your favorite hymns. I remember Grammy telling me about let us all press on and battle him in the Republic. I'll have to ask about more. Um, I also want to watch more Westerns. I'm sorry I didn't watch more with you, but I know that when I go over to Grammy's, I can watch them with you now. I also want to learn more about history and politics. I'll start reading the news again so I can ask you what you think of it about all that nonsense. But you always had something to say. I was always so proud of myself when I could talk about those things with you, even if I didn't really know that much. But I'd stretch what I did know for quite a bit. I also want to go to the temple more. I know you loved working there and fought for it even when your body was fighting against you. Eventually I'll catch you up on more day-to-day -day things there's still a bit to cover before then, like some of your qualities that I want to emulate. Your wisdom, humor, patience, how you weren't as talkative, humility, etc. Maybe um, tomorrow I'll be able to tell you about smaller things like the new decorations in my room and the stat homework that I didn't realize was homework. But for now, I think that's enough for today. Thanks for listening. I miss you even if I can't believe that you're gone yet. I love you. Talk to you tomorrow. Of Natalie, your youngest grandchild. Dear Papa, I was worried about my psych test this morning, but I got a nice one after bed. Um, <laughs> whenever I'm stressed out but um, end up doing well, I think about the story you told me the day before I took the SAT. 
I remember, if I remember correctly, you were so determined to do well on yours that you stayed up late studying the day before the exam. That day, you were so tired that you barely stayed awake to finish each section until you fell asleep after each one. When you got your score back, it was near perfect. Uh, I know it wasn't your goal, but that just showed me how smart you are. I hope to do half as well. Everyone um, always says how good at math you are, especially mental math. How come I couldn't inherit that? I've been struggling in stat this year. I don't like my teacher, and I'm pretty sure you didn't like her either. Um, but she's not as bad as that one teacher you'd always tell me about from college. The one with the insanely thick accent who talked about one thing while writing another thing on the board, and who erased one of the long blackboards as soon as he finished the second one. I'm trying to remember what you said the highest final grade was. 26 or something? I remember not being able to believe it. That doesn't give me a lot of confidence for college, but I know you have enough for any of the two of us. My mom told me that a couple of days before, you told Grammy that you had to go pick me up. From where? Natalie drives herself now. I have to take her to Massachusetts. Why? She has to get to college. <laughs> I'm flattered that you remember that I got into one of the schools up there and you think that I could go there. Um, so I'll leave it at that for the letter for right now, but I know that if I'm able to have half the confidence in myself that he had in me, that I'll be able to do this fine. So I'll leave it at that. and. Um, I apologize in advance, like Nancy said, she has the stage of ugly crying. That's the only stage of crying I have, so it's going to be ugly no matter what. Um, I also didn't really know we were doing this, so first couple memories that pop into my head about Papa. Um, so he loved baseball, and I was really into sports. Um, and growing up, he had got this little stupid wooden t-ball bat um, that he was going to practice with us and show us how to learn baseball. Um, and we were out in the, their massive backyard playing one day. Um, he was showing us, okay, put it on the tee, smack it out, um, and then he did it, and we got in, we had only been out there like five minutes, and he knocked one out, cracked the bat, <laughs> and he was like, huh, I guess I don't know my own strength, and now the game's over, so sorry, <laughs> um, and he felt so bad that he went out and bought a metal, a metal bat. Um, he's like, well, now we can play all day. The bat won't break. Um, and his first, um, first and foremost was always to make everyone else happy. Um, and he never, never failed to do that. He wasn't a swimmer, never really learned how to swim, um, but he was always, every summer, out in the pool with us, kind of just waiting in the shallow end um, so that we could swim with him and um, again always making people happy at um, our wedding reception he had kind of been in pain all day um, and the severity of it we didn't really know um, but he made sure to stick it out through the entire reception um, took picture after picture Sorry, just so he could be there. Um, and the following day, he was in the hospital. And he said, yeah, I wasn't in too much pain. Um, it just goes to show the strength he had and the um, desire to make those around him happy. Um, and just one more bit wanted me to share um, was at our um, ceiling. 
we all know he couldn't say very many names and um, struggled with everything. And so my husband has a very long Hawaiian middle name. Um, it's Kavika Ikaika. And the first time he said it, he butchered it. Um, we kind of just went along with it. Uh, the Lord knows what he's, he's talking about. It's fine. And then the second time he said, Ikea. <laughs> so we joke that that's now Ben's middle name. Um, but he always, he always had a way to make everyone laugh. As soon as you get up here, it's like, um, and after my husband and I got married, we planned on moving to South Carolina um, for work, and we had about three months time where, um, we didn't have anything going on until we started working and um, it was really hard to get an apartment for just three months and without even mentioning that, um, Papa and Grandma offered their home, their extra bedroom to us for those months and so, and my husband had previously lived with them um, for a summer for work and uh, we were able to have those three months to just be with them and learn about him and um, my husband is really into politics like Papa and they just would talk for hours and hours about everything especially because the election was going on um, and then a couple years later when I was pregnant, um, I was extremely sick just every day. And Papa called twice a week. Would just check in for about five or ten minutes and just say, how are you doing? And we happened, it was right after his cancer diagnosis, and um, we happened to be on the same nausea medicine, <laughs> and we had similar symptoms, and so we would talk about them and just laugh, and every time I would say, oh, yeah, but mine will go away in nine months. And he would say, you're more important. My pain is a and um, that's who he was. He put everyone else first, and he would undermine his own pain and suffering to make others feel like they were more important. Um, there's so many memories that we each have with Papa, and um, I'm just really grateful for them. Um, the Papa died on Tuesday, and that Sunday, I called to FaceTime Grandma um, in hopes that Papa would be lucid enough. And um, so we talked for a while, and Grandma told me that um, this was pretty much it. And so she said, I don't want anyone to rush home or feel like they have to come. Um, and luckily we live in Michigan, and so it's just a 10 hour drive. Um, and after we hung up, my husband said we need to go home and say our goodbyes. And that's what I had been feeling for like a week. And, um, so we plan to leave after work on Tuesday, and um, Monday night I was getting ready for bed, and I just thought, I don't, I don't want to fall asleep because I know I'm gonna wake up to the news. And um, on Tuesday, sure enough, I woke up to a text from my dad, and he told us, and 
of the conversations that we ever had lasted more than five minutes total. I think both of us preferred it that way. Um, the words that we do say are usually to the point. Um, I know at least on my end I was happy with the short conversations. Um, I remember one time he called me. I was out of school. Um, I don't even remember what I was doing. And he called me and just said he was calling to check in on me. Um, at the time, he was sitting outside on a bench outside of a TJ Maxx while Grandma shopped. <laughs> uh, and he said, 
Uh, I just, I didn't want to keep walking around the store looking at clothes, so I decided <laughs> to call you. Um, and I don't even remember the conversation we had other than that. We just talked a little bit, and he caught up with me, and uh, I caught up with him. Um, and that was it. And less than five minutes later, the call was over. Um, but it was things like that. Just He was always ready to check in on each of us um, because he cared about each of us deeply. Um, a couple of weeks before he passed, uh, I had the opportunity to be with him for an afternoon. Um, well, my wife went out with Grandma, um, so Teddy and I were with him. Uh, And he was weak and out of it for most of the time. Yeah. But the times when he did wake up, he wanted to interact with us. Yeah. There was one point, Teddy and I were playing on the ground. And he looked down and he just said, There's nothing, nothing more you could ask for from Grandpa. So I'm grateful for that. I've got 27 something years of memory, memories of him. And most of those are ones that are for me to remember. Uh, some. A lot will be to share with my children. Because they're still young enough, they probably won't remember him vividly. But I know they had a relationship with him. morning that he passed. We were preparing to go over. And we talked with Teddy about, you know, we're going to go over to Grandma's house. Uh, and he said, Papa, He always loved to give Papa kisses in his chair when we would go see them. Uh, and on our way over, we had to pass right by their old house on Friendship Road to get there. I've never made mention to 
Teddy. But that was their old mm -hmm. house. And right as we passed it, he pointed and said, Papa. And that for me was a special moment just to know that he's there and he loves all of us. And even though he's not here with us physically, we all get those special memories that we had with him to remember him and the lessons that he taught us and the love that he had to give us because of everything else that was the most important that love he had to give us and I'm so grateful for that and for the great grandpa that he was to all of us you guys look terrible um, I really want to thank you I have to start out by saying my life has improved because I knew Andre. And this, he's brought us all together and he's he and Sarah have created something wonderful in your family and in the beliefs that you have. And I too used to get phone calls from Andre while he was sitting at TJ Maxx waiting for Sarah. <laughs> but mine always would always go, hi Jan, this is Andre. After saying, I, I would always say, hi, Andre, and he'd go, hi, Jan, it's Andre. That was just his thing. But he would always call and check on me, and he would um, call to thank me or to see how my children are or whatever. But he was a good person to me and to those around him. Um, I never did hear him say anything ill of anyone else. Um, I do know that whatever he touched was with gentleness and kindness and he made everything better and I am thankful that my children knew him because their grandparents are like a zillion years away from here and so my Lucy doesn't know a life without Pop because there's, there's only one Papa that's what she used to say and um, unfortunately Lucy got homesick so she's not here to um, pay tribute, but I do want to say that I know that they love him and everything that he did for them because he cared about them. He cared about all of us. And we are all better people for knowing Andre. And <clears throat> may we all take the lessons and examples that he gave us and become the better people that, we know we can, that he knows that we can be. As he was, you know, I was with him um, the day before and a couple of days before, and I was just standing there talking to me. And as he was talking to me, he's laying in his bed, he looked at me and he goes, what am I doing here? And I said, I know, Andre, just hang in there. There's part of the plan is enduring to the end. And he was like, yeah, but this stinks. And I'm like, yeah, enduring stinks because life isn't easy. And I said, maybe this is, this is part of your work. And he said, then I'll do it. And I said to myself, I'm like, okay, I have no idea what he's going through, but whatever I'm going through, I can do it too. And we can all do it. And I'm thankful for that example. And I'm thankful for Andre. I'm going to be sharing um, yeah, yeah. some sad moments, but I also wanted to share some some um, some funny stories as well. So I, I met Andre <coughs> probably about 35 years ago or so. Um, I think I remember exactly when it was. It was in, uh, in 1987 um, when I was serving there as, uh, as a missionary. And he was the, uh, the bishop of this ward. And one of the first things you notice about Andres' his accent because he has an accent that's different than anyone else's. There's no one in the family who has an accent like him, and you can't tell is it a Jersey accent? Is it a New York accent? He just has he, he just had his own sort of accent. Um, and um, like Chris said, he was he was terrible with names. Um, 
he had a hard time remembering them. He had a hard time pronouncing any any names that were over um, two syllables, um, especially if they were ethnic names. Um, that was that was really tough. And it was funny um, with with being an attorney and being in in court um, with trials or hearings or um, any sort of municipal hearings or that. And, and if there was a transcriber who who had to um, I mean, this is when you had people who would uh, um, take shorthand and, and, and transcribe. Stenographer. Stenographer, sorry, that's the word I'm, I'm looking for. So when you had a stenographer, um, you would see the, um, uh, the man or woman sitting there, and, and Andre would say a name, and the stenographer would just freeze for a minute and just, and just you know, kind of shake his or her, her head. And then inevitably, when you got the transcript back, um, it would just be filled with question marks with, with that person's name, and if that person's name came up um, quite a bit, then it would just it would have a lot of question marks, and that was just kind of funny. And, and it was funny knowing that that was going to happen because when you were in court or at a hearing, and you knew that there was this tough name that Andre was going to have to try to get out, and and just waiting for that moment when the transcriber would freeze, and, or the stenographer would freeze, and would. Be trying to figure out what did he say and 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 um, um, how am I gonna how am I gonna um, figure out what uh, uh, what to do with that with that name in, in this transcript. Um, Andre was very gentle. He was a non-confrontational person. He did not want to engage in in any sort of confrontation with anyone over over anything. And somehow, as an attorney, that that served him very well. Um, uh, whether it was judges or other attorneys or difficult clients, um, he just had this VIP air to him. He was very stately, very regal, and, and people just didn't mess with him. Now, um, because I was much younger and inexperienced, they had no problem messing with me. Uh, and, and that would often happen. And we would have situations with clients they wouldn't complain to Andre about anything, about about the way a matter was handled or the bill or anything like that, but they would have no problem taking it out on me or Mike or Chris or Susie or somebody else. That was fine, but somehow Andre always uh, was able to um, avoid those sorts of situations where, where people would um, uh, yell at him or be very hard on him. He was... Um, he had a tremendous work ethic. He definitely worked much harder than I did um, ever, and he was extremely ambitious and industrious. He loved those to-do lists, and his to-do list would um, it would would be so long. I mean, mine on a Saturday, you know, I you know I might have five to ten things if I if I were lucky. Andre would would have dozens of things on on his to-do list, and it would include a deck, for example. We're gonna we're gonna put in a deck. Um, and it's not just going to be a, uh, a single deck, it's going to be a wraparound deck, and it's not just going to be the, uh, the, the forms, it's going to be the, the platform, the railings, everything. We're going to finish this entire deck this weekend, along with all the other things on, on the to-do list. Uh, uh, like Chris said, he, uh, he was a terrible driver. <laughs> he really was. Uh, most of the time it was unintentional, but there were times when he did do things intentionally, and then he would just kind of shrug like <laughs> People would honk, and he was just like, ah, you know, I had to get off at that exit. You know, that's, that's just what I had to do. Um, and, um, of course, being in New Jersey, you get horns, you get... You get um, gesticulations. You get uh, you know hands uh, out the window. You know whatever. Uh, um, now Andre's driving was so bad that somehow he even managed to crash into the garage door um, multiple times. So he'd be in the in the garage um, and and he would um, forget that he hadn't he hadn't. Um, raised the uh, the garage door so, so usually his habit was as he was going out he would he would hit the button on the on the on the wall and the garage door would come up but oftentimes um or at least sometimes he would forget to do that and then he'd get in his car start it up and then back into the garage door and that happened um 
multiple times. And it was so bad that not only did he back into the garage door, but there were at least two or more times when he actually drove into the front of the, of the, of the garage door. How do you do that? Um, Andre was in a hurry to get home for dinner. He was in a hurry to get home to see Sari. And I could never figure out how he drove into the garage door, but he was so impatient. Um, you know, and, and sometimes people don't realize because Andre was so gentle that he was extremely impatient and he could not wait for that garage door to come up and he would run into it. And that happened a couple times. So I don't know who the garage door repairman was, but but uh, but Andre did. He's down in the, the home yeah, he, he <laughs> did. Um, and um, the other thing. Um, um, that I don't think I mentioned was how stubborn Andre was. And people didn't realize that because he was very quiet, very gentle, uh, very passive in many ways, but he could be quietly stubborn. And one of the things that he would do um, at the office, and there, there were so many of them, but, but he would um, he would constantly lose keys. And we literally made dozens of, of front door keys um, over, the, over the years. and and we would um, try to get him to put that key on a on a um, on a on a keychain, but sometimes he would, but but many times he wouldn't. And so we we would um, have these these keys made, and and um, um, they would be in a in a drawer, and he'd always forget his key someplace, and he'd say, you know, I need to I need to take a key, and and um, and he'd pull out a. a a, a key like this from the drawer and then he would insist on just putting it in his pocket and we made dozens of keys over the years because he just kept losing them and even when you put them on a on a on a keychain for him of some sort he would still lose the the uh, uh the, the key somehow and, and the dry cleaner must have collected like i said dozens of keys over over the years from all the keys that were um were in his pockets um so we um, yeah, we have so many of those of those kinds of, of stories about Andre um, and just the funny stories alone could take a, um, a very long time. Um, but I really appreciated how much he loved our our family and especially our children. He um, made sure that we were always included that, that we always uh, felt like we were um, <coughs> We were family, and and um, uh, and I and I genuinely appreciated the fact that uh, that since I was so far from my family in California, that I felt like they were part of his family, and so I um, I appreciate how much he made me feel like family, and how much he made our, our children feel um, like family, and and that and that's something that I'll always remember. Um, and um, um, I just lost my train of thought for some reason, so probably should just end there. But uh, I just wanted to share some some funny stories because I think we have some sad moments, and I just wanted to try to bring a little humor and bring some of the, the funny things. And, uh, I'm very grateful to have known Andre all of these many years and all that he did for me and for my family. This is one of those that he wanted to get down on the floor and play with. And as you've watched her today, you've seen she's been very busy. And um, he would just watch the kids as they would run past him um, as he would sit in his recliner chair. And Sari has a glass tabletop coffee table and fingerprints licking the table. You know, that's, and she would leave it there because that was signs of, of the grandbabies being there. Um, like Joe, I just kind of have a couple of fun, happy memories. As you can see, this is what Allie and the girls put together. This is about maybe one, one millionth of the pictures that have been spread across the house this week as they've gone through. And everybody's been finding all their favorite pictures of them with Papa and fun things that they, memories that they've had. And just being sitting listening to them tell their stories to each other and their memories has been so heartwarming and um, 
it's just been fun to see how each one of them, as Alex said, each one has a very different relationship with them. We lived with Andre and Sari um, when Megan was born. So we had all four kids with them for, um, for several years. And then they lived with us when they came back from the temple. So as Megan said, she had many mornings sitting with Andre for breakfast. One of the pictures, as Chris said, Tyler would climb up and sit on Andre's head. Megan would climb up and sit on his shoulders and drool on his baldy head when she was about this age. Um, he always took time to have, to have the kids with them. And most of you know about his love of elephants. And as they've all said, they each got one of his elephants to take. Well, Anya has a couple elephants of her own back home in Detroit. And she will point to them all and say, Papa, because that to her is they go hand in hand. And um, just one very tender story. Last night we were listening to the song, I Love to See the Temple, with Anya right before she went to bed. And she said, Temple, Papa. And it was just that simple that in her mind that is just exactly how it is. And um, one of our beliefs, for those of you um, who are not of our, our faith, one of our beliefs is that we do believe that families are forever. And knowing that we will be able to see Andre again and that the kids will have Papa back and, and that belief is so um, important for us because it really does help us know that he is about um, our father's work. He is busy up there helping just keep the, um, keep the work rolling and um, I too am very grateful. I've known him many, 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 many years and have had a lot of fun and happy stories as well. But also just as part of the family, we want to thank all of you for supporting um, all of us and for being such dear friends of Andre's and Sari's and loving them and helping um, spend this time together. Thank you.